As you might be seeing, this is not a Spielbergian type of production, but hopefully uh, um, it will be good. And, and Roly and I were, were talking before we started this, and uh, uh, the question came up, you know, who are we to talk about something so sacred and so gorgeous and so holy is what we're going to talk about. Then the other question was, well, who are we not to talk about it? So, and, um, so anyway, this is a great honor and a, and a privilege and a blessing to be able here to talk about this. And I thought maybe I would I would just give a few opening remarks about perhaps perspectives that are that are uh, represented in this panel. And of course, this will be a dialogue and, and communication as we flow on. And I have no idea where this is going, but perhaps maybe we talk about what is integral Christianity, just to define terms, and then uh, let it rip. And uh, I'm very much a six on the Enneagram, and I just go with the flow. And uh, show me the first three chords, and I'll make up something and just see what emerges. So, and plans are what you do when God, you know, doesn't indicate otherwise. So, so Amen, Mark. Be here with us. So um, I, I want to. <coughs> I'll, I'll say I'll introduce your perspective, which is probably kind of strange, but anyway, I will. Um, my 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 perspective here is uh, I, I came from a Catholic. Uh, background and my my uh, spiritual first spiritual awakening happened when I was 11 years old, 11 or 12. Anyway, I think it was 68. And um, um, then from f from uh, Catholicism, I went into a rather kind of fundamentalist Christian thing, and I dropped out of school when I was 14 and tried to uh, live according to the Gospels for so call and follow Jesus and live according to, it was anyway it was an interesting time in the 60s early 70s and eventually the organization I was associated with turned into a rather toxic cultic type yucky thing and I left that in my early 20s and started trying to reconstruct my world and, and now what and through the process of this, this um, my current spiritual growth and, and uh, awakening I rediscovered Christianity not because of what anybody said. Well, no, because of what a lot of people said, what Ken Wilber said, and what Rowley said, and and, and uh, different teachers and influences I had. But but mainly from my own my own uh, my spiritual practice, the the whole Christ thing just started coming back online. Not bidden, mind you. I wasn't looking for it, but there it was. So uh, I, f I feel myself coming back into to this um, Christianity, whatever that is, in an integral way. Um, as kind of scary and, and kind of full of grace and kind of just glorious at the same time. So I, I guess I, I represent the, as many of us people who have left the tradition for various reasons, who've been wounded or, or couldn't find anything that was speaking to them at their current developmental level, and now I'm returning and uh, with fresh eyes and an open heart and uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of excitement. And this is uh, Father uh, Edmund Grace, uh, Society of Jesus. And he, our Jesuit, for the, anyway, for those that don't know what that means. And he has been a, a friend of ours for the last five years, and more than a friend, feels like family at this point. And it's just very fortuitous that he's here to represent that perspective in this conversation. And here is Roly Stanich, which one of my, uh, um, when I was coming back to, to reowning this, this deep Christian part of myself, I was like, oh, okay, well, Roly. If he's a Christian, then color me Christian. And a beautiful model of, of 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 love. You know, it's like like who was it said? You know, there's nothing wrong with Christianity, but so few people have tried it. You know, and when I saw Roly, I was okay, man. There's some real grace and, and beauty and love here. And uh, Leslie Hersberger, we we connected about four months ago uh, at a get together of the graduate school and JFK, the integral program, and and we started talking about a lot of things, but we really connected on uh, the, the, the integral Christianity thing. And um, uh, Leslie comes from a Catholic background, but also is here to represent uh, uh, the feminist uh, point of view in this, this whole uh, dialogue. So that's my um, opening statement, and who would ever like to open <coughs> uh, from that? Or maybe I should pose the question. What are we, we're saying this is about integral Christianity. And I might add that Rowley has uh, worked and then I'll be quiet. We work with Ken very closely. Ken Wilbur, who is the, the the outstanding kind of genius that brought all this this integral thinking into the world for five years, um, and and then was was in charge of Integral Spiritual Center, which was this deeply ecumenical movement of spiritual teachers in different traditions, and and has been really a pioneer in in uh, 
um, <clears throat> bringing integral Christianity into the world and is currently envisioning and writing and creating a book uh, about that. So maybe I'll just hand it off to you, Roland. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when I look at my own life, uh, I've been Catholic from the beginning, grew up with uh, beautiful Catholic parents, and I understand why almost everybody had to leave that tradition at some point, and it's so clear to me why that, that happened. And for me, some, for some reason, that, that never happened. And um, if any of you have heard of Father Thomas Keating, I saw him speak when I was 20, and it changed my life. I can't say where it would have gone if, if I hadn't seen this man talk, but also walk. He preaches sermons by the way he walks, and when I saw him and experienced him at that point in my life, I, I saw I'm already home, I don't need to go anywhere. So for the next five years or so, I began thinking, well, how does my life look then if I'm to remain in, the, in this tradition and practice deeply in this tradition and share it, and how do I go about doing that? And I found myself in Egypt in 1994 and uh, had a couple extra days before returning home. And I'd heard about this sort of mystical monastery called Sinai, uh, St. Catherine and Sinai. And this is at, at the foot of Mount Horeb and where the burning bush is. And it was a place that really called to me. So I traveled from Cairo. We, we took a bus from Cairo and ended up going under the Red Sea. There's a tunnel under the Red Sea where the, where the Jews were supposedly to have gone through the Red Sea. They have a tunnel there now, so I just remember <laughs> being on this bus. <laughs> and going into the Red Sea, and then, and then in the Sinai. And um, it was just the most magnificent evening and night. Uh, I hiked up with a Jewish couple, and we had a beautiful hike up. And at the top, we met a, a Bedouin Muslim who had a little tea house on top. And so I sat with this Jewish guy and this Muslim guy, looking, and we could see forever from up there, and just talking about the world and everything making sense and making peace. And I remember uh, the Jewish guy taking out a pack of cigarettes. So I had one of the only cigarettes I've ever had, because that's the only thing you could do on top of this mountain was to have a smoke. And then the Jewish couple went back down, and the, the Bedouin Muslim guy went to sleep. And I just found myself alone on this mountain and thinking, if Moses came up this mountain and got the Ten Commandments and everything else that he got, then maybe I would know what to do with life. Maybe I would get some indication of what I'm here for. And I just looked up at the stars that Abraham would have looked up. It was in the, interesting in the Gospel tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and felt that God was making a promise to me. And received the most direct communication I've ever had, the, the thing that I've understood the most clear of anything in my entire life, and that was love. It wasn't a word, it was a way of being that, that was communicating. It was, it was to love. And I remember thinking of the words of the Elton John song, uh, the last song, and the chorus goes, I never thought I'd lose, I only thought I'd win. I never dreamed I'd feel this fire beneath my skin. I can't believe you love me. I never thought you'd come. I guess I misjudged love between a father and a son. And so I just, I was in a sort of ecstasy the whole night knowing what the purpose is and, and not needing to know anymore and I never received any more and walked down from that mountain knowing that that's what I had to do in life. And Again, I realized I was at home in the, in the tradition because the tradition is the way of love, and I would say the way of embodied love. And you know, even in, in ancient Hinduism, there are a number of paths or a number of yogas to the divine, and there's the yoga of work, the yoga of knowledge, and gnosis, the yoga of love. And in modern Hinduism, they would point to Christianity as a shining way of love. And that maybe never in history was there a person who so fully loved and who so fully in his heart united heaven and earth and tied in, in a knot in, in that heart. And then he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. He's the very way. And that means that we're to follow in that way, to follow in those footsteps. And then the Gospel of John says, 
you will do these things that I have done, you will do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I think he wants us to take that seriously. So coming down from that mountain, I knew that I was already on, on the, the way because it was the way of love. And in my life, I'm just uh, amazed by, by the gap between the love that I feel called to and I feel we're all called to and the love that I've been able to love so far. But I think it's that very gap that keeps me and, and keeps us going, seeing who we could be or seeing who we really are in the eyes of God. Something Father Thomas said, and I've been a student of his for a long time, he said, the whole purpose of the Christian tradition is to have the same experience of the Father or ultimate reality as Jesus did, as Abba, as Father or as Daddy. That's the whole purpose. And then I, you look back and you see that the tradition has done everything else but that, but that's the message, and the message mm -hmm. is uncorruptible, and the message is incorrupt, that, that we are to love. <clears throat> so, then again, at, uh, at around 30, I had the great blessing of reading Ken Wilber, and again, another intervention that just deepened my own practice of Christianity, because I could see it in the context of evolution, and I could see how a promise like, you will do greater things than these, could actually be true in an evolutionary universe, that's actually possible. But without it, I wouldn't be able to make any sense of that promise. That's how that promise can make perfect sense. Mm -hmm. So, I've just seen that this the path is, is bottomless. Um, a, a teaching that Ken Wilber has elucidated about three, four years ago, which again was very, very liberating. He just said, okay, I, I've been looking through perspectives. First person perspective, second person perspective, third person perspective. And at the time, I had a bit of an inferiority complex because I, uh, the community was so Buddhist. I was the token Catholic, or the token Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and seeing these these profound non-dual realizations coming out of the East, and wondering, does my own tradition go to that depth? So what Ken said is, look through your first person, second person, or third person perspective, and look all the way up, and there you will find God. The line in the Quran, which is really interesting. God's is the east, and God's is the west. Therefore, look to the east or the west, and there you shall see the face of God. And Ken was just saying the same thing, but look in your first, second, or third person perspective. Look all the way up, and there you will see God. And Christianity was a natural second person perspective, where you enter into a relationship with the great other, or with the lover and beloved, and you realize yourself to be the beloved, and you realize uh, the saints, they weren't the ones who loved the most, they were the ones who realized they were the, the beloved and just couldn't help but act from that. They didn't even have to try to love, they just recognized their nature as beloved of God and moved from there. So that teaching of the three faces of spirit was absolutely beautiful and then I, I realized again that, that this tradition goes all the way down, goes all the way up and what is the what are the higher reaches of entering into a relationship with lover and beloved, and I, I don't know if we know, but that's the that's the calling of the path, that's the promise of the path. So, from where I stand, I just see an incredible merging of this ancient way of love and of the very latest in post-postmodern thought. Beautiful confluence of these two, and a, a real way forward that respects 2,000 years of tradition <clears throat> and respects the very latest in scientific and philosophical thought. And uh, I feel incredibly privileged to be standing at that intersection and then to meet you and all of you at that intersection and to imagine where does this path of love lead. <clears throat>